Okay, time to look into some applications that make use of contact. We have three examples lined up for this lesson. The first one is a bowling ball, ramming into bowling pins to demonstrate an impact type of contact. In the second example, we'll revisit the discussion on belt drive and see how friction is crucial for that design. And in the third example, we'll see how contact pressure can be used for assessing the design of an O-ring. In this example, we'll also investigate how a change in the design would change the way the contact formulation used for solving it would make a huge difference. Let's start with the bowling ball. Bowling is a recreational activity where a heavy ball is hurled towards a set of pins that are arranged in a format with the objective of game being to dislodge all the pins. This game is very old. Its origins dates all the way back to 5300 BC, which is the Egyptian times. A key for winning this game is to transfer momentum from the ball to all the pins so that they are dislodged. Since the ball and the pins are all individual objects, there must be a contact formulation defined between them to enable this transfer of momentum. Let's simulate this game. We arrange the pins in the prescribed format and then impart an initial velocity to the ball and let it onto the pins. When we define a contact interaction between them, the momentum is properly transferred to the pins and we see them getting dislodged, which is as expected. Now, let's simulate the same scenario, but ignore the contact formulation this time. We see that the ball simply drifts through them and does not transfer momentum to the pins. Of course, this is not physical or will always end up with the ball in the gut. But this shows how contact is not automatically accounted for in the governing equations, which is why we need to define the interaction. This is a simple example that demonstrates the importance of contact. Now, in the next example, which is the belt drive, we learn the importance of friction. Bell drives are seen in various mechanical systems. They are popularly used as timing belts in automobiles. These are used for transmitting power from one shaft to another. In general, there is a flexible belt that runs over two or more shafts. When one of the shafts rotates, due to the friction between the shaft and the belt, the belt starts moving too and as a result, it starts pulling the other shaft, which sets it in motion. A successful design would have enough friction between the shaft and the belt, so the belt remains in a sticking state with the shaft while it is running over it. But how crucial is friction in this application? Let's simulate it and find out. In this example, we set up a simple bell drive system with two shafts and a belt that's running over them. We first create stress in the belt by stretching it so there's enough contact pressure developed between the shafts and the belt. Next, we start rotating the smaller shaft which is called as the driver. As a result, if there is friction present between the belt and the shaft, the power is transmitted and the bigger shaft, which is called as driven, also starts rotating. This is how a belt drive works. Now suppose we lubricate the shaft surfaces more than we should and end up with nearly frictionless interaction between the shaft and the belt. Now if we start rotating the driver, the belt simply slips over the shaft and it never transmits the power to the driven. We can also observe this by plotting the angle of rotation of both the drive and the driven shaft in both the cases 
as a function of time. In case of friction, we see that over time, the driven shaft starts rotating, but in case of frictionless contact, the power is never transmitted to the driven and therefore its angle of rotation does not change with time. This example shows why frictional force is important and how it can be used in designing mechanical systems. Now let's look at our final example, which is an O-ring assembly. O-rings are commonly used to seal the gaps between mating parts in several assemblies, such as water filters, espresso machines, and many more. The performance of an O-ring is assessed based on the contact pressure that is created at the interface during operation. In this example, we will explore the design of an O-ring system, which is designed to seal a pressurized fluid. Under the action of the fluid, the O-ring is expected to deform, but support the applied pressure. After deforming and getting to the final state, it should fill up and seal the gaps. We'll explore two different designs of the mating assembly and see how the O-ring performs in both the designs. In both the designs, we have the O-ring installed between two steel components. After installation, we apply a fluid pressure on the O-ring to see if it can withstand the applied pressure. In this case, a frictional contact is used between the O-ring and the steel components. The quantity of interest is the contact pressure between the O-ring and the steel components. In design one, the lower component has a flatter base and a fluid pressure of 50 megapascals is applied on the O-ring. In design two, the lower component has an inclined base and a fluid pressure of 70 megapascals is applied on the O-ring. In both the designs, we'll see how the choice of contact formulation may or may not affect the accuracy of results. In design one, let's compare the contact pressure calculated using both the penalty and the Lagrange contact formulation. Here are the contour plots for the contact pressure distributed around the contact regions. From the legend, we can see that there isn't, there isn't any major difference in calculations between the two formulations. In such a case, we may go with the penalty formulation as it's more robust due to relatively inexpensive calculations. Now, let's shift our focus on the second design, which has this small inclination cut into its design. Once again, we'll look at the contact pressure as calculated by both the formulations. Here, we notice that there is a big difference in the values calculated by both the formulations. This is because when the O-ring deforms, it starts flowing about this point, which is pretty sharp. Since a penalty formulation is more forgiving in terms of penetration, it allows the O-ring material to penetrate into this section, which results in lower contact pressure calculation. The same design, when solved using Lagrange formulation, results in nearly zero penetration, and therefore, trustworthy contact pressure calculation is obtained. In design two, the change in design of the base introduces a sharp corner over which the material flows. As a result, the penalty formulation would require large contact stiffness to avoid penetration. A Lagrange formulation, on the other hand, imposes a zero penetration constraint. So, it captures the flow of material over sharp corner more accurately. This simple example shows when one formulation may be beneficial over another 
depending on the design or application. Of course, there are various other scenarios and examples that demonstrate more uses of contact. But the three examples we saw today covers the concepts that we discussed as part of the sections on contacts.